It takes great spiritual potency to preach to the conditioned souls in this world. They come to this world for anything and everything but Krishna consciousness, love of God. They are determined. They have their duryavrataha. They have their determined vow that they will enjoy in this world come hell or high water. <laughs> How to convince them otherwise? <laughs> Prabhupada was coming on the boat to America. He was thinking, when I arrive, I will tell them these regulative principles. I will talk about this chanting and they will say, Swamiji, take your message back to India. We're not interested here in America. <laughs> Lo and behold, they were. The youth, they were ready for the message. And now all of America is benefiting from that message. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur, who will push on this movement? There's no material reason that such a movement goes on. It's not necessarily just good organization or just money. Really, it's a question of purity. Preaching is the essence. Books are the basis. Utility is the principle. But what is the force that pushes on a spiritual movement in the material world where no one's interested. It is purity. So he looked at the heavens, he looked at the sky, and he prayed, Lord, Chaitanya, you please send someone from your personal camp to come down here and continue these missionary activities. And history has shown who that personality was. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Thai. He carried on, and he gave the mantle to our own spiritual master, Shri Prabhupada, who has given the mantle to us. <laughs> Just see what we have inherited. <laughs> we have inherited this mantle, this commandment to preach Krishna consciousness, which has come down from so many great souls, so many parishads. Now it's in our little old us. It's in our hands. What can we do? Individually, nothing. But together we can do something wonderful. If we work cooperatively to serve Sridhar Prabhupada, we, in our own humble way, as a society, can continue the missionary activities. So, Mukunda Das, uh, his son was called Raghunandana Das Thakur. And they could see from the very beginning he was a great soul because one day the king, he called Mukunda Das back. Come back, I'm ill. I need your attention again. So Mukunda said, but I am, I'm supposed to make the, the noon offering to the Gopinath deity. Household deity was Gopinath. Well, what can I do? I, I'll just, I'll ask my young son, Raghunandana. He's just a boy at that time, maybe nine or ten years of age. Raghunandana, you make the offering to the deity. You make the offering to Gopinath. Oh, Peter! Oh, well, well, I, I don't know how, how to do that. What, what do I do? I haven't really... No, you... Mata will cut the fruit and make the sweets and like that. You just go in and you put the plate down on the altar and you pray. That is sincerely. Gopinath, please accept this. Prasad. Okay, Peter. So Peter went to meet the king and the mother cut up the fruits and Raghunandana went into the altar, he put the plate down on the, on the altar and he prayed out loud, Lord Gopinath, please accept this offering. Please eat this offering. And wait it. Lord, eat it. Please eat it. You're supposed to eat the offering. I'm so fallen a devotee that you won't even come and eat. Oh, Peter's going to be so mad at me. He started crying. Finally, out of compassion, the Lord spoke. My dear, Raghunanda, this... I'm eating just by glancing at the food. What? The little boy said, you're eating by glancing? No, you have to eat. <laughs> no, my little boy, try to understand. 
a deity eats by glancing because all his senses are completely spiritual, interchangeable, so I can just... The boy said, I don't understand all this philosophy, Lord. He just please eat it. <laughs> so the Lord came down off the altar and he ate the offering. So this took quite some time, actually. And the mother was, was waiting outside and she... Finally, the boy came out with the plate. But the plate was empty. <laughs> and she said, Raghunandana, did you eat that food? <laughs> Mommy, no. Peter told me to make the offering. He made the offering. Go, Peter, I ate it. <laughs> so sometime later, Mukunda Das came home. And the mother said, Prabhu, something happened today. You know, Gopin, you asked Raghunanda to make the offering, and he went in the offering, but came back with an empty plate. I think he ate the offering. Mukunda Das said, Raghunanda, did you eat that? No, Pita. Gopinath. <laughs> so his father said, okay, let's take this big ladu. Now you go back in the altar room, and you offer this to Gopinath. So Raghunandana went back in and sat down and he's praying again. My dear Gopinath, please accept this nice prasad. Huh? Lord, aren't you going to eat again? The deity said, I'm so full from the last offering, I can hardly eat anything. So the boy said, just take a bite, okay? So the deity came down, he took a big bite of that, that luglu, and the boy came out with a half-bitten. <laughs> he said, see, Gopinath ate it. <laughs> now his father accepted the story this time because he was secretly watching the pastime as it was taking place. So well, this is quite something amazing. I don't think any of us have ever witnessed something like that, where the Lord comes down off the altar and eats the offering. We accept the philosophy that he's eating by his glancing. But for his devotee, the Lord actually took these extraordinary measures. Now, something very amazing happened as a result of that. The word spread that the son of Mukundadas, Raghunandana, the Lord ate the offering, personally ate the offering that that little boy made. That word spread. And in a nearby town here, there was a great devotee living. His name was Abhiram Thakur. In those days, there were so many great parishat, so many great devotees. If only the, had the scribes recorded their every daily activity. By the grace of the GBC, just after Prabhupada's departure, they asked Satsavut Maharaj to write a Lila Mrita. It took him a number of years, and we have that big volume now. Really, that's only a summary. We also have Hari Sori's Transcendental Diaries. And we have memories by other devotees, probably by Within 50 years, we'll have so many books about Sridhar Prabhupada's path. Imagine if in those days, in the times of Lord Chaitanya, the devotees had written in great detail about these great parishad, these great devotees, how much nectar that would be. Of course, it was a difficulty because a lot of times, those devotees, they gave the instruction, don't you dare mention my name in that Chaitanya Charitamrita. That's the problem. You don't, see, you don't hear much about Lokanath Goswami. You don't hear much about Gopal Bhatt Goswami. Why? Because they weren't famous? No. They were so famous. They were famous because they were great devotees, but they were very humble. Na dhanam na janam sundarim kavicham vajagadish kamaye mama janmini janmini shwe bhavatat bhakti Devotees praying, Lord, I have no desire to accumulate wealth. I don't want to enjoy beautiful ladies. I don't want patishta. 
Although you may make me a famous devotee for whatever reason you may have, please let, don't let me become attached to that fame. Let me know that I am always and forever your eternal servant. When Prabhupada signed his original passport coming over to America, the all details you had to fill out in the Indian passport, it had occupation on the Indian passport. I don't know if it still has occupation on the Indian passport. Address, name, address, occupation. You know what Prabhupada wrote? His occupation? Servant of his divine grace, Shri Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. That's what he considered himself. Of course, that in itself is the most glorious thing. But a devotee always remembers from where the mercy is coming, from his spiritual master. So, we don't often see, sometimes we don't have very long records of those devotees' activities. It would have been nice. Someday we'll know because we'll join the fast things and we can see firsthand. <laughs> But um, Abhiram Thakur, he was a very great devotee. In the Gaur Gonadesha Dipika, it's described that actually he was uh, Sridham in Brajalila. He was Radharani's brother, one of the exalted cowherd boys. And when he heard about Mukunda Das's son in this area who had caused the Lord by his devotion to come down off the altar and he said, I want to meet him. So who wouldn't want to meet such a great devotee as Raghunandana? And who wouldn't want a great devotee to come and meet them, to meet you? If you heard, oh, Abhiram Thakur is coming to meet you. Oh, that's wonderful. But some of the people were thinking, uh-oh, Abhiram Thakur is coming. I'm going to hide when he comes. You know why? Because Abhiram Thakur, he was such a powerful devotee that when he would offer obeisances to a Shalagram Shila that wasn't a Shalagram Shila, what is that? Well, you see them in the market in Loi Bazaar. From the, <laughs> the people who are selling all think they know how Islam devotees like Shalagram Shila, so they get what looks like a Shalagram Shila. If you know something about Shalagram Shila worship, you can see pretty easy. But if you don't know, you may think, oh, I will buy. One of my friends, God Brothers, he purchased a Shalagram Shila market. So many chakras, nice big mouth. Maharaj, look at this. I held up to the sun. I could see the sun through it. I said, Prabhu, this is wax. This is not a Shalagram Shila. <laughs> and we traced it back to a factory somewhere near Benares who makes these so-called Shalagram Shilas for the market to make money, Kali Yuga. So it, apparently in those days the concept made something, well anyway, whenever he would offer obeisances, Abhiram Thakur, to a stone that was not a Shalagram, it would burst into powder. It would explode and turn into powder. And if he offered his obeisances to someone who had material desires in his heart, that person would immediately die. So the Vaishnavas are very humble people. Vaishnavas are very humble people. They're thinking, oh, my heart is not yet cleansed. I am trying, I'm trying, but sometimes these thoughts are coming to my mind indicating I'm not as advanced as I may think I am. So people were thinking, if Abhiram Thakur comes to this village of Sri Kanda to see the son of Mukunda Das, they're all going to go into hiding. Of course, he was also a very merciful Vaishnava because he had one, something very powerful. He had a whip. He named his whip, he personally named his whip Jai Mangalam. And anyone who was hit with that whip would achieve ecstatic symptoms of love of God. That type of whipping we want. There's a story in Bhakti Ratnakara that one time Srinivas Acharya went to visit uh, Abhiram Thakur. And at that time, they did, 
they didn't know each other actually. So Abhiram Thakur, he kind of wanted to test Srinivas Acharya. Srinivas Acharya was a young man at that time. And uh, when they met, because Abhiram Thakur was senior, he, he told the young Srinivas, so before we have our kata, you please go take your bath. And he arranged from the vo local villagers that he would get some foodstuffs. And he said, then you, you cook prasad and you take prasad, and after you finish your prasad, then we can have our kata. So Srinivas Acharya, the young boy, took his bath and collected the vegetables, and he's started to cook, and he offered the food, and he sat down to eat, but Abhiram Thakur called some of his disciples over, and he said, you go sit down with that Srinivas Acharya. He's just starting to take his meal now. You sit down with him and see what happens. So you can guess, educated guess. <laughs> Those disciples came down and paid their obeisances to Srinivas, sat down with him, Srinivas said, Prabhus, um, are you hungry? Well, as a matter of fact, actually, we're, we're starving. Well, please, you take, take some prasad, you take some prasad, you take some prasad. He distributed his own prasad to those Vaishnavas, and then there was nothing left. He was selfless. This is a Vaishnava. He's always concerned for the welfare of others. Why? Because he's completely happy and satisfied in Krishna. That's how he does it. It's no mystery how a devotee is always concerned about the welfare of others because he himself is fully satisfied in Krishna consciousness. Savai pumsham pada dharmo yato bhaktira doksaji ahitukiya patiyata yayat mashu prasiditi. Yayat mashu prasiditi means. Devotee just has the basic material necessities, but he's topped up, as they say in Britain, with Krishna consciousness. He's full with Krishna consciousness. He's completely happy. Shantushti. He's completely happy. So he's just concerned about others. He's selfless. This is a, a Vaishnava. So Abhiram Thakur could see, oh yes, this is a Vaishnava. He distributed the prasad to others. He's ready to give everything to Hari Guru Vaishnava. This is Vaishnava. Serving Hari Guru and by everything to the Lord, to the Guru Vaishnava, Bhakti Sananda Saraswati Thakur. Many of his Grihastha disciples were like that. Selfless. Grihe Thako, Bhani Thako. Narottam says whether one's a Tiyagi, a sannyasi living in the forest, or he's a householder with beautiful wife and many children. If he has the mission of Lord Chaitanya in heart, in his heart, I take the dust of that <coughs> devotee's feet upon my head. Be he a tiyagi, be he a grihastha. If he's a servant of Goranga, I want that person's association. And we saw that, or it was seen in the disciples, the grihastha disciples of Shri Bhakti Sarana Saraswati Thakur. Bhagaji told me one time, Vishwam Bardas, he, one of Prabhupada's friends in Vrindavan, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> this would solve all the financial problems at Chalpati. I, don't, I never heard that you have financial problems. You're something like the mission of Bhakti Sarana Saraswati Thakur. I heard he would create some fabulous project, a diorama project, a, a new temple here, a new preaching center there, some fantastic idea. He would get all the brahmacharis out, collecting, 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 and they'd become exhausted. They'd come to the amount, they'd collect it. Guru Maharaj, here. He'd say, fine, now we have another preaching project in the next city, so go out and collect for that. <laughs> Although the money is there, we keep coming up with these wonderful ideas how to spread the Sankatan movement. It would be very easy if all the householder devotees, at the end of every month, brought that check into the room of His Holiness Radhana Swami <laughs> and said, Guru Maharaj, it is yours to do with as you see fit. What if Maharaj just smiled and put it into his pocket? <laughs> But he wouldn't do, he would obviously give. This is the spirit 
of selflessness. We have these examples in the history, so we know what level we have to come up to. Oh yes, I am selfless. I am giving this percentage and that. But are we like those disciples of Bhakti Sanana Saraswati Thakur who only a hundred years ago were coming in and putting everything on the table, selfless Guru Maharaj. Just whatever you want to give me is Bhakti Shaiwati. They were very happy with that. That is how Bhakti Sananda Saraswati Thakur defeated the Ram Krishna mission in Bengal. That is how he spread Krishna consciousness all over India. And that is how he set a base for spreading Krishna consciousness all over the world because he encouraged that selfless spirit in his disciples. Two things are required. The bona fide spiritual master and the bona fide disciple. The spiritual master is obviously qualified, otherwise he cannot be guru. It's up to the disciple to become a qualified disciple. And the qualified disciple and the qualified spiritual master, they can do wonders in spreading Krishna consciousness all over the world. So you don't have to have any concern. Are you serving the bona fide? Obviously, you have to come up to the mark and be the selfless disciples, and then you'll see how Krishna consciousness spreads all over this country. And it must spread all over this country, because Prabhupada came back from America. He said, my spiritual master sent me to the West to preach in the English-speaking language. He was successful at that. He did above and beyond the call of duty. He spread Krishna consciousness not only in English, but in all, practically all the other languages of the world. Talk about above and beyond the call of duty. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare but your guru will help you. Just like Krishna says. All of them as they surrender to me, I reward them accordingly. Guru is Lord's representative. As you surrender, he will continue to bless you and encourage you. So seeing the selflessness, seeing the selflessness of Srinivas, Abhiram took out his whip. <laughs> Ah, tears, tears of love flowing from the eyes of Srinivas. Hair standing on in. Go Ranga, go Ranga. Voice faltering, falling on the ground unconscious. <laughs> the wife of Sri Ram had to stop him. How much ecstasy can this little boy take? He's just a boy. Hit him when he gets older. So, this Abhiram Thakur, when he heard about the son of Mukundadas, he wanted to come here to this village to meet him. So, the parents, Mukundadas and his wife, they're thinking, you know, every parent, you know, my boy, is, he's a ray of Vishnu, but he's also Nati. <laughs> he does this. They were worried. Oh, he's going to come, and he's going to pay obeisances to Raghunandana, and maybe our little boy is a ray of Vishnu, but maybe some clouds got in the way. <laughs> maybe he has some desire. So they went and they hid him in one neighbor's house. They hid him in the neighbor's house. So Abhiram Thakur, he came to the house of Mukunda Das. These guys have the Babaji's come, they walk, you know. Hare Ram, Hare Ram. Is this the house of Mukunda Das? Uh, mm, yes, it is. I would like to see your son, Raghunandana, please. Uh, well, today he's not at home. He wasn't feeling well. He's at some neighbor's someplace. So what did Abhiram Thakur do? Determined to have that darshan of such a great soul. He sat down on the front doorstep. Hey Krishna, hey Krishna, 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 Hari Hari, Hari Ram, Hari Ram, Ram Ram, Hari Hari, Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari, Hari Ram, Hari Ram, Ram Ram, Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari, Hari Ram. Meanwhile, 
Raghunandana, later to become Raghunandana Thakur, he heard that this great saint was waiting for him, and he ran. He ran home. And the description in Bhakti Ratnakar is so sweet how when these two devotees saw each other, the love that manifested in their hearts for each other was just indescribable. How they came and they embraced and they were weeping and like this. Just like sometimes, this is the nature of this type of love. Sometimes you actually were a society of strangers in one sense. I probably don't know most of you. Some faces are familiar because I've had the good fortune to go to Jalpati and some of your exalted preachers have come overseas, but really I don't know you very well, but I really feel like I'm home here. This is our real home, Prabhupada said. Bombay was his office. Vrindavan was his place of wor worship. Mayapur is his home. We don't think, I don't think I'm American, white-skinned, English-speaking boy. No, I'm Prabhupada's servant, like Prabhupada said of his own Guru Maharaj. Like father, like son, we learn these things. And you don't think of yourselves necessarily as, as you know, Indians or from UP or Maharashtra. No. Jivar Supoya Krishnara Nitya Das. You consider yourselves the total servants of Krishna or Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So when we come here, although by our past karmic activities we have a particular body, a particular language, a particular dialect, a particular whatever, we've given it all up mentally, internally. So when we come here, we feel we're home again. This is where we belong in the Leelastan of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And these are my real brothers and these are my real sisters. And, this is my real. and you can come up to a devotee you've never met before and just open your eyes. Prabhu! Hari Bosh! <laughs> and you can sit down, you can have Krishna Kata and be very happy. Prabhupada said when two sannyasis come together, what do they do? They speak Krishna Kata. It comes naturally from their hearts, Krishna Kata. So when we come together, we can feel comfortable in the association of devotees anywhere in the world. These are our real friends and friendship you need in Krishna consciousness. If you just have Hari and Guru but you don't have Vaishnava, the process is not complete. The formula will not work. Any metal practitioner will tell you, you can't leave something out of the formula. Every little part of that pill is required for the success in curing the disease. Charya Vaishnava Seva Naratam said, who's ever been liberated without the association of the Vaishnavas? You can't just worship the deity and ignore the Vaishnavas. That's Kanishta Adhikari. You can't just worship the deity and serve your spiritual master and ignore the Vaishnavas. That would be an offensive mentality. We have to have very deep, close relationships with our God brothers and our God sisters. The heart requires it. So-called friendship in the material world is not friendship at all. I saw one bumper sticker when I was in America. Friends who love their friends don't let them eat meat. Popular bumper sticker. Friendship in the material world means I like the same type of sense gratification, same clothes, the same music, same type of boys, same type of girls. Again, material nukrishne patas fatova. Down with. That's not real friendship. Real friendship is when you come together like this and we chant and we have Hare Kata and we take Prashad. And that friendship goes very, very, very deep. Material relationships are very superficial. These type of relationships which we're cultivating by programs like this, they go very, very, very deep. Like Naratam and Ramchandra Kaviraj. Those boys were like this. They were like one soul and two bodies. Bhakti Ratnakara says when the people spoke of one, they automatically spoke of the other. They wouldn't mention the name of Naratam without mentioning the name of Ramchandra Kaviraj. 
Just like when you speak of someone's wife, and you mention his, her husband, when you speak of the husband, how is your wife? Because it's one body. Isn't it? Husband and wife are one body. Papa said one time that woman is the better half. <laughs> but, so, these, so friendship is like that. Actually, uh, Ramchandra Kaviraj was the disciple of Srinivas Acharya. And towards the end of those manifest pastimes, Narottam Das Sakur and his close friend Ramchandra Kaviraj were living in Keturi. And they were just doing bhajan together, and chanting japa together, and discussing Hare Kata together, preaching together, eating together, sleeping together, everything so close, so deep. Satisfying was the relationship. Srinivasacharya came one day and said to his disciple, Ramchandra Kaviraj, Ramchandra, you come with me to Vrindavan. I'm elderly now. I need someone to help serve me. When those two men looked at each other, Ramchandra Kaviraj and Narottam, they practically died of separation. They couldn't conceive, they couldn't imagine how they would be separated. They relished the same Krishna conscious activities together for years and years and years. But duty of disciple is to follow the instruction of the guru, however difficult it may be. One time Prabhupada said, along with the instruction of the spiritual master comes the ability to execute it. So never think that your guru has given you an instruction which is too difficult for you. He will never give you an instruction which will cause you to fall down. Rather, it's meant to elevate you, help you come up to the mark. So Srinivas, he bowed down to his master and they left. What a pitiful scene it was. As Srinivas and Ramchandra Kaviraj walked, like you see through the fields here, over the horizon, leaving Naratan Das Thakur alone. They went to Vrindavan, Srinivas and Ramchandra Kaviraj. They spent some time there. <coughs> Narottam was just waiting for the day when they would return. Days went by, weeks went by, months went by. Ramchandra didn't come. What had happened is Srinivas Acharya, feeling so much separation from Garanga Mahaprabhu, he could not bear that separation any longer. As they say in Vrindavan, once I went to see one sadhu the other day, and his, the other sadhus were there. I said, where's, where's Ramdas? He went, well, what does that mean? He left this place, meaning he went back to the spiritual world. So months passed, and Srinivas left this world. And feeling separation from his guru, Ramchandra left this world. No one had the heart to tell Narottam Das Thakur. Finally, one day, his senior most disciple, Ganga Narayan Chakravarti, he had to come and tell Guru, guru Maharaj, Srinivas Acharya has left this world. <laughs> Unconscious. He woke up. My Lord, Ramchandra Kaviraj has also left this world. Narottam fainted on the ground, unconscious. Hours they couldn't revive him. He was never the same again. He wrote, at that time he wrote that prayer, separation from the Vaishnavas. Yeya nilo Acharya Taku. It's coming from his heart, feeling the separation due to the intense attachment he had to his friend, Ramchandra Kaviraj. And soon after that, Narottam left this world. These great devotees, because the, relation, the attachment is so strong, the separation is also strong. You are, you've had that experience. You lose something that's not important. You don't, okay, I, uh, I'm attached, but you lose something that's very important, oh, oh, 
We don't really know what is real attachment. Our attachment is a perverted reflection. The perverted reflection can never equal the original thing. You take, you catch the mirror, you catch the sun in the mirror, okay, you can burn the grass and it, but the sun in the mirror is not like the sun in the sky. Our perverted attachments in this world are not like the deep loving attachments of the residents of the spiritual world. And neither can we understand their feelings of separation. But one day we hope to. Because when they asked Gorgovinda Maharaj, what is the purpose of this Krishna conscious movement? He replied, crying, 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 crying. <laughs> you know? So, when Abhiram Thakur and when, when uh, Raghunandana met each other, they never met each other, but because they had the same interest of heart, it was just like meeting an old friend again. That's what it's like when we meet here. Meeting you is like meeting old friends. We sing together, we dance together, we eat together, we laugh together, we cry together. Do strangers laugh together, cry together, sing together, dance? No. How is it possible? All by the mercy of Lord Chaitanya all by the mercy of Prabhupada, he's introduced into this wonderful, loving, spiritual world of Krishna consciousness. Shri Prabhupada Ki! So, after hugging and embracing, they offered obeisances. And the parents of Raghunandana were just, oh my gosh, Abhiram Thakur is offering obeisances to our son. Nothing happened. He stood up. Wow, he is a ray of Vishnu. <laughs> he has no material desires. Because Aviram Thakur, if you offered obeisances, you had material desires, you were finished. They were, then they started dancing together. Dancing and dancing and dancing and dancing. And uh, Raghunandana, he had one ankle bracelet on his, on his ankle. And as they were dancing, that ankle bracelet flew into the sky and landed in some village nearby here, and it went down and into the earth and created one kunda, one lake. They call that Nupura Kunda. So if you get hot out here, one day you're doing lots of kirtan, you come back to this place when it's really quiet and you have a nice ecstatic kirtan and some prasad and you want to refresh yourself, go to Nupura Kunda and bathe in the holy waters where the ankle bracelet of Raghunandana Das Thakur created that beautiful lake there. So, okay, so I have to summarize. <laughs> yeah. Some other things I discovered. One time Lord Chaitanya was giving instructions to his devotees uh, and he asked Mukundadas, between you and Raghunandana, who is the father and who is the son? <laughs> it's a simple question, but Mukunda said, Raghunandana is my father and I am his son. And Lord Chaitanya said, yes, one who is aspiring, inspiring us and teaching us about Krishna consciousness, he is our guru, he is our father. So even though the boy was young, the father considered him like the father. Just like I told the story in Rajmanda Parikha, there's one very nice little girl, devotee, of child of a devotee parents. Her, her name is Padma, Padmavati. She's nine years old. And she is the, um, her grandmother is Irmala, my god sister, and her mother is Champakalata, and her father is Mayapur Chandra. So we were walking together in Vrindavan, going somewhere. I was talking, and I said to her, you know, do you ever dream about Krishna? She said, no. Nope. I said, no, oh. because sometimes I've talked to kids who have dreams about Krishna. She said, no, nope, never, never dreamt about Krishna. I said, okay. She said, but I dream of Radharani a lot. <laughs> oh, really? 
So I said, um, really? She, yeah, just last night I had the most beautiful dream of Radharani. I said, really, what did you dream? She said, well, I went into the Kunj and Radharani was sleeping. This is a nine-year-old girl. And very carefully, according to how I had been instructed, <clears throat> I woke Srimati Radharani up. And Radharani, upon seeing me, she was so merciful, she rose out of bed and she kissed me on the forehead. <laughs> Thinking, wow, that's pretty amazing. I said, I wish Radharani would kiss me on the forehead. <laughs> she said, she, she had a disgusting look, she said, she won't kiss you on the forehead, you're a male. Radharani Radha only, only kisses the, her sakis and manjaris and said, Okay, Padmavati, that's all for today, yeah? You want to take some prasadam together? Maybe you could leave a little remnant or something? <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes we see that those who are the children or sometimes, just like my own son, Prabhupada, my own son was my former ashram, Grihastha ashram, I had my son Gorshakti on my shoulders. He was one and a half. He only knew one word, Prabhupada. And I had him on my shoulders in his diaper. <laughs> and Prabhupada was visiting the community in Umayyapur and uh, Prabhupada came, looked out the window and my son saw him. And he went, Prabhupada! Prabhupada! He started passing urine. <laughs> He was so excited that she, and Shri Prabhupada was so excited to see Gorshakti. He was waiting. He probably leaned out the window and Hare Krishna. And, Prabhupada, and then I said, Prabhupada! Shh! <laughs> <laughs> and there was this whole like thing going on. Like Prabhupada and I said, no, like, went on for, you know, like 45 seconds or something. And then Prabhupada just closed the window. And that night, we had darshan with Prabhupada. Prabhupada was talking about devotional service. And then he said, and yes, he said, these devotional relationships are so nice. He said, he said um, um, just like this afternoon, he said, I was looking out my window and I saw one little boy who was waving at me. He said, it was, it was just as if we were old friends in a previous life. <laughs> when I told that to my wife, she said, oh my, Raya Vishnu. <laughs> <laughs> So sometimes we see things in the children or we see things in younger devotees. Just like my beloved disciple, Braja Leela Devi Dasi. She was a 19-year-old Russian girl who left her body due to leukemia, leukemia, 19 years of age, but due to her love for her spiritual master and her spiritual master's love for the disciple, we were drawn away from our responsibilities in Europe and we came to India, to Vrindavan, the very afternoon that she left her body, actually. The doctor said she was supposed to leave the day before, but somehow by the Lord's arrangement, when I came into her room, she had three hours. So those three hours I was instructing her, but her responses were making me Krishna conscious. I said to her, Rajalila, do you have any desires left that I can help you cast off and Embrace the lotus feet of Radhasram Sundar. She said, Guru Maharaj, I'm so embarrassed. I am deeply, deeply embarrassed. I have a very ugly material attachment. I got ready and I you know, got my verse book out. What is it, Bhajalila? I have a desire to eat a tomato. <laughs> so I said, Bhajalila, if that's the only desire you have left in this world, to eat a tomato, you're, you know, you're, you're better off than the rest of us. And then, you know, she said, but I'm casting it off. And she started calling, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna. And this huge kirtan, tumultuous kirtan style. And she had Giriraj in front of her eyes. And she left such a distinguished, no pain, no bewilderment, just her eyes fixed on her deity and her spiritual master calling out the names of the Lord in her ear and her god sister chanting. She just very gracefully just opened up her mouth and almost left a smile and just... She just left. And I was thinking, if only I could be so detached, if only if I could be so devoted to my guru, if only I could be so advanced in Krishna consciousness just to be 
looking into the eyes of the Lord as I left. So, though she's my disciple, I was so grateful. I learned something from her. So when I eventually I read this pastime, how, how Mukunda said, he was asked the question, uh, Lord Chaitanya asked him, who is the father and who is the son? Mukunda said that uh, Raghunandan is my father and I am his son. I could under understand that. So these pastimes, they, they took place in this, this sacred abode. There's other pastimes as well. Um, Lochan Das Thakur, another great devotee who Maharaj mentioned, he wrote his famous uh, Shastra here. He was a great devotee. He was, in, th in those days, the, the um, parents, they married the children very young. He was actually married when he was five years of age. And, uh, but when he grew up, or when he became a young boy, young older boy, he went to the ashram of his spiritual master, Narhari Sakar. And he lived as a brahmachari, and he forgot about his marriage. But the parents of the girl, they sent notice to Narhari Sakar that, you know, this boy, um, Lochan Das, you know, he was married to our daughter when they were very young, so please send him home, because he's old enough to marry her now. So out of duty, Lochan left the ashram of his spiritual master as a brahmachari, and he went to the village where the girl lived with her parents. He was being very dutiful. And when he got to the village, it was like not many people were around. There was this one girl drawing water from the well. So he said, Mataji, do you know the house of this particular couple? So Mataji said, yes, I know. You go there, you turn left, right down, just down the road there, and you'll find the house of that man and that woman. So he went there, and he knocked on the door, and they let him in, and, oh, so you've come. Yes, yes, I, you know, I've, I've come as ordered. And suddenly one girl walked in the room, and he was shocked. It was the same girl that had given him directions to come to the house. So he smiled, he said, but I cannot remain here. And the parents said, but why? She's our daughter, you married her. He said, no. When I saw her today, I called her Mataji. I called her mother. I cannot remain married to my mother. <laughs> so somehow they agreed and let him go, and he was able to remain a lifetime brahmachari. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Um Oh, I could go on for a long time, but it's getting dark here. So, with your kind permission, I'll conclude. I mean, we could actually speak for hours, we could speak for days, we could speak for weeks, we could speak for months, because we just mentioned a few of the devotees who live in this area of Srikanda and a few of those pastimes, but uh, maybe sometime in the future we'll have the opportunity to go on Purukam again with His Holiness Radhana Swami to the same place and continue with those nectarian, nectarian pastimes. It'll leave us with a hankering to hear more, and that is in itself the perfection of Krishna consciousness. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.